Let's get into the Word together. Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17 as we continue our series through the book of Colossians. And so I'll begin reading at verse um, 12. I'll read to verse 17 and we'll get into our study. Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12, reading to verse 17. Paul writes, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So Paul has just given a command to the church here in chapter 3. And the command that he gave to the church continues to apply to us today. He's instructed the church to forsake sins of the flesh, and he's commanded them to live proper lives. Now, this has been clearly the central theme of this letter from the very first chapter. In chapter 1, Paul had revealed his deep concern and his prayer for them. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 contained his prayer that they may be filled with the knowledge of God's will, that they might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him and being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So this is the purpose and the joy of the teacher of the gospel. The purpose and joy of the, of the preacher of the gospel is to encourage people to be followers of Jesus Christ. I, I have a, a feed that comes to me, a news feed, and and uh, oftentimes, there'll be advertisements that are put on by a pastor who is asking other pastors to go to some kind of event, some seminar that, that they're going to be holding, and they want us to come to the seminar. And recently, I was um, watching one of the advertisements, just wondering, really, what it was that he was, was trying to sell. And I found it interesting in that as I, as I watched the video... And I'm going to say it the way he said it. I'm going to quote him in one, as he said something in one part. But he said, you know, this is a, a surefire thing. You know, we'll get people to come to your church. And, and he's telling uh, me that if I want to, to start filling the pews with people, that, that, that I need to come to his seminar and, and I need to learn to do that. Because he said, and this is a quote. And this kind of shows you where the coarseness of the church is today, where the church is in the way we communicate and all, because this young man is uh, referring to himself as pastor. But he says, after all, our goal, this is his words, not mine, uh, after all, our goal is to get butts in the seats. And when he said that, I thought, is that right? That's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why Paul gave up his life for the gospel. That's why the, uh, the apostles did the things that they did is so that we could have something like that, so that people would occupy the pews. So that's the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way it's supposed to be. We, we have a goal, and the reason that Paul was writing this is to produce faithful, loving, spirit-filled disciples of Jesus who live out the Word of God, because as John said in, in 3 John verse 4, John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You see, the whole purpose of the, the exposition of the Word of God, the reason that Colossians and all these other letters were written is to encourage people to be loving, spirit-filled believers in Christ who live for Jesus Christ and walk in the truth. And, and, and that's why Paul is writing to the Colossians. He wants them to know that. We're to set our mind, he says, on things above because we long to see Him face to face. We, we look forward to being in heaven and we look forward to seeing Him. It's like what he said to the Philippians when Paul wrote and said in chapter 3, verse 20, 
Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even, even to subdue all things to himself. And so there's a purpose in writing this. And he's been sharing, he's been saying to them, there are things you ought not to do. Why? You're seeking things above, not things that are below. Why? Because you, are, you died and you're alive yet in Christ. He said, because Christ is our life, he's going to appear and we're going to appear with him in glory. He's been saying that through chapter 3. The false teachers have entered into the church. They brought a bad message. They're, they're, cre they're creating disciples who are discouraged and, and all who don't have a heavenly hope. And, and they're, they're infiltrators who are bringing in a, me a message that undermines the grace of God. And so he says, this is the purpose of this. You're going to go to heaven. You're buried in Christ through baptism. He says, you're alive in Jesus Christ. Therefore, seek those things which are above and, and put these things away. And he went through a whole list of things to put away. In other words... Because God has set us apart for himself, and because we are deeply loved by God, what manner of life do his children live? As I mentioned before, he had just commanded them to put to death a life that is given over to sin. And he began to speak concerning the sins that were to no longer be in bondage to. He said, uh, put aside fornication. He said, put aside uncleanness, passion. Put aside evil desire and covetousness. He said, put aside anger and wrath, malice and blasphemy. Put aside filthy language. Put aside lying. And we're to put these things aside now because we can. We've been born again. God's Spirit is within us. There are too many people who say, well, I do that because it's my nature to do that. No, not if you're born again. If you're born again, now you have power in the Lord Jesus Christ to put these things aside. God never gives a command that he doesn't supply the power to obey. And God says, put these things aside. It's like what it says in Romans 6, verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He went on in verses 13 and 14 of Romans 6 to say, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. So he didn't give you a law. He didn't give you some kind of command that you cannot fulfill. You can in the power of the Lord. So put these things off. So as he's been speaking about putting these things off, he now commands us to put on certain things. Paul describes the behavior and attitude that God expects of every believer. The thought is, since you have been raised with Jesus and since you are the elect of God, this is how you are to live. And it doesn't matter how you feel about it. This is what you're to be. This is what you're to live like. You see, there are many modern believers that have great struggles. They want to be authentic. They want to live completely centered and integrated with their own values and beliefs. They want to be honest about how they truly feel about their own life and views and, and live them out completely aligned with their personal feelings and with this as a motivation for them it's important to be real in order that they might avoid hypocrisy for them this is the path of true spiritual growth i was reading something by a gnostic philosopher a modern gnostic philosopher who said this he said we advise disciples not to follow anyone let them follow themselves each one should follow his resplendent and luminous inner being I, by nature, I am sinful. By nature, I don't have a resplendent, luminous inner being. Um, the heart is desperately wicked. It's terribly deceitful. Who can know it, Jeremiah asks. You see, so you don't follow what your inner inclinations are. You actually die to those things. Well, when you have that kind of philosophy, the, the result is you end up doing whatever feels best. So if these people want to do something, they will. If they feel something deeply, it's got to be true. Their moral foundation is built on being real, being their true self. And their moral code is developed by what makes them comfortable. That's how they live. If it feels good, we used to say, then do it. Well, many say, if it doesn't feel right, why should I do it? 
If I do it and I don't feel like it, isn't that being a hypocrite? Well, the answer to that question is no. I'm not a hypocrite when I do the right thing without wanting to. Hypocrisy is to profess a belief that is intentionally different than the way I really am. There are a lot of things that you do that you don't feel like doing. That's just a fact. Some of you are saying, yeah, that's why I'm here right now. I mean, <laughs> talk to any mama. You know, it's, you have a baby. The baby's a year and a half or two years old, not feeling well. Baby goes to bed in the middle of the night or later, three in the morning, because you don't really sleep that well. Your ear is always attuned to the cry of the baby. You hear an uncomfortable thing. You hear a little gag sound. And what do you do? You get up. You run into the other room. And the baby's there beginning to vomit. And she vomits all over herself. And what do you do? You call your husband. No, what do you do? <laughs> you get the baby. And you take the baby. And you wash the baby. And her, her hair is filled with her, with her throw up. And, and you wash her hair. And she's crying. Mommy, I feel bad. And, and you just hold her. And you, war and you wrap her up in a towel. And you hold her to yourself. And you, you rock her. And, and you love her. And you say, you'll be okay, baby. You'll be okay. Mama's here. That's what you do. Did you want to do that? No. You wanted to sleep. You wanted to rest. You're tired. Why did you do that? You're a legalist. No. <laughs> You did that because your husband wouldn't. No, you did that. <laughs> you did that because you love that baby. Did you feel like it? It's a different question. No, I don't feel like doing that. I feel like laying down, resting my tired body, having a full eight hours. That's what you feel like. But what did you do? You did the right thing. Why did you do the right thing? Because of somebody else's needs. That's called love. And that's what Paul is talking about. There are people who will not do the right thing because they don't feel like it. They're following their true luminous inner self and all of its resplendent glory. And they're ignoring everybody else's needs. And that comes through following the philosophy of the world. And so doing the right thing even when I don't feel like it, changes how I feel about it. Making a decision to do the right thing because it is the right thing actually works to transform me. And in this section, Paul gives certain qualities that the Colossians are to put on. What kind of life earmarks a believer who understands how loved they are by God? If we put off sinful things, well, what do you replace them with? Well, he's telling us here, and verse 12 and following. So in verse 12 he says, Therefore, because of all these things being true, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. So he begins to speak concerning the things that we put on. You put these things off, you've taken some things off, but now you need to dress yourself. Now, we do dress. We dress for certain things. We dress when we get up in the morning to go to work. We have a certain work clothing that we wear. If you're playing on a sports team, you dress appropriately for that team. If you're going to go out on a date, you get dressed. You go to church, you get dressed. Even a baptism or a wedding, you'll dress in a certain way. We, we dress for certain things. And as believers, we also dress in a certain way. And he's telling us what to put on. So he begins first with tender mercies. When he speaks of tender mercies, literally that speaks of compassion. It speaks of co-suffering. Compassion is a sympathetic consciousness of someone else's pain with the desire to alleviate it. You saw a, a video this morning of our, our compassion ministers at work. That's compassion. That's called putting on tender mercy. And you see these, these older ladies who haven't had their hair done or makeup put on for a long time. And you see these people there who are loving them and caring about them, holding them. And all that's called tender mercy. And you put on tender mercy. And now why would he say that? Well, instead of anger, wrath, and malice, we now express compassionate concern for somebody else. When you have tender mercy, when you have compassion and care, that ensures good marriages. Because you need to have tender mercy in marriage. It, it ensures a good family. It, it, it ensures good friendships, a good church, even a good society. When this society, our American society, 
had more of a concern over the things that were right and wrong, those things that were approved by God and disapproved by Him, we had a different kind of society. But even today, there's still an awful lot of people who have a tender, merciful attitude towards those who are outside, and we still see that. You see, the point is, not only should we do not, do not uh, hurt anybody, but we should be especially busy doing good. So believers are known by certain things, and you're dressed in a certain way. And because you're dressed in a certain way, people will know that you uh, are, have a certain uh, like or dislike or whatever. Even today, again, I mean, if you like a sports team, you might wear their gear. You might walk in wearing whatever, whatever college you, you appreciate, whatever professional team that you appreciate. You'll walk in with your gear, and people know that you like this particular team. You're known by what you're wearing. And so we should be known by the way that we wear Christ and the things he would have for us. And so instead of anger and wrath and malice, we have compassion. Uh, we don't want to hurt others. We want to be busy doing good. We're to be known by our, our compassionate action towards others, is what he's saying. In Galatians 6, verse 10, he says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So instead of yielding to anger and wrath and bitterness, we, we are now to be tender and merciful. Like it says again in Romans 12, verse 10, where Paul said, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference one to another. In Galatians 5, and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And so he says, As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. He goes on to say, Put on kindness. Kindness is moral excellence. It speaks of goodness or gentleness, a warm-heartedness, being considerate. It's been said kindness is goodness in action. It is the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4, Paul said it like this. He said, love is kind. It's the spirit of kindness that actually helps us to forgive one another. Ephesians 4, 32 says, be kind to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Kindness reacts with gentleness, tender-heartedness, and it responds, and those are in need, with pity and compassion. You're known as being kind. When I first got saved, I was sharing with a friend of mine. I said, if there's any quality I ask the Lord to give to me, it's the quality of kindness. I want to be kind. I want to have that gentle, compassion, loving heart. That was one of my desires. It's one of the things I asked the Lord if he could please work that into my spirit. Kindness is a beautiful, beautiful garment to wear. So he says to us, put on tender mercy and put on kindness. He goes on in verse 12 to say, put on humility. Humility is lowliness of mind. Humility is a result of an honest self-assessment. It's been said that humility is the antidote for self-love because it helps us to see ourselves for what we really are. Humility enables us to resist seeking vengeance on those who have hurt us. Humility is an honest self-assessment. And the way you become humble is spending time with the Lord because the more you're with Him, the less of you you, you like. And you humble yourself before Him. I knew a guy many years ago. I had just gotten saved. It was a long time ago. And he was an older man. I was 20 at the time, and he was an older man in his 40s. <laughs> at least, maybe 50, maybe as old as 50. He was old. I was, I was amazed that he could still hobble around town. And he was... And he and I had a conversation more than once. I had known him because of the neighborhood and all, and I had gotten saved, and I was speaking to him about the Lord, and and he originally had, uh, initially had been rejecting the gospel, but God was good, and not through me, but through some other place he went to church or whatever, he had given his heart to Christ, and and after doing so, he came to my parents' house where I was living at the time, and, and he said, David, I want you to know I gave my heart to the Lord, and I said, that's great, but this was a guy who used to brag about everything. If you had one thing, he had two. If you had three, he had five. He, if it was good, his was better. He's just that way. He was this older guy, you know who had this attitude, and, he, and it used to really get on my nerves, to be honest with you, because he was always bragging about one thing or other. 
And there he was bragging with me about how he has now a healing ministry and he goes around and he tells people to get healed and, and he's beginning to boast to me, which was, you know, uh, off-putting. And so I said to him, listen, I said, I said, you know, if God's going to use you, and I was only a young man, I said, if God's going to use you, you know, there's one thing that he wants to bring into your life, don't you, to be used? What's that? He wants you to be humble because he wasn't humble. See, he wants you to be humble. I'll never forget him as he responded by saying, humble, I am humble. He goes, as a matter of fact, I'm the most humble man I know. <laughs> he was proud of his humility, which I find really interesting because humility is simply seeing Christ for who he is in contrast to who you are. And the closer you draw to him, the more into the light you are in him, the more of your own imperfections you begin to see, which causes his grace to abound in you as you yield yourself to him by humbling yourself. You see, often failure to humble ourselves leads to a break in a fellowship with other believers. It's pride that got Satan cast out of heaven. And the Bible makes it clear that God hates it in man. In Proverbs 11, verse 2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. In Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So it's humility that enables us to turn the other cheek and to resist the temptation of getting even with those outside of the body of Christ as well as those who are within in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, Paul was speaking about this problem that was happening in the church of Corinth. And he says, brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you go before the world and make the cause of Christ to look bad. You see, genuine humility is in contrast with the false humility of the, the teachers of error that Paul had already spoken of, this, this false humility. It's the attitude of a soul that has lost its pride when receiving God's mercy. In Psalm 116, verse 5, it simply says, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. So when you've personally received His mercy and it really has impacted you, you begin to learn to be merciful to others. He goes on to speak of meekness. Meekness is the opposite of rudeness and self-seeking. Meekness is the willingness to suffer insult without responding in kind. And Paul went through this a lot. He was insulted. He was, he was attacked in many ways, and he was writing to the Corinthians and he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, we labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. When he says we are the offscouring, when you're cooking something and and uh, whatever it is you're cooking begins to just burn and remain on the pan, and then you scrape it off, that's called off-scouring. And he says, that is what we have become. We are the off-scouring of all things until now. So what did he do? How did he view this? Well, he knew that he was looked at as the lowest of the low, but he also knew that that he was just passing through, moving on to heaven. And that was going to be the part, of the part of the work of God in him because he knew that the things that he was going through were producing greater character in him. And because of that, he could patiently endure it. He goes on to say, put on long-suffering. Long-suffering is another word for patience, if you will, though it speaks of the duration because irritation normally doesn't go away that easily. If, if something irritates you for a moment, you can get over it. But when you're married to it, no, but when it's there all the time, <laughs> it's a little difficult. It's hard. It's hard when this thing will not stop bugging you. 
You know, sometimes you go to work and you may have a co-worker and that co-worker comes in on occasion and they always are irritating. They say something dumb, you know, and you go, oh, man, here they come. And they come in, hey, blah, 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 and they say something dumb and, and you just kind of look at them, you know, they irritate, but they go away. Some people have a desk right next to you. So patience is putting up with something for a moment. Long-suffering, it's there next to you. And it requires a lot more. So he's saying you need to bear. You bear with people's insults. You bear with their belligerent behavior toward you. He's saying don't be quick to respond to their meanness and the pettiness. And you need to remember the example that was given to you by Jesus himself. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us something about that. In verses 20 through 23, he speaks to the church and he says, What credit is it if when you're beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. You see, this was shown to us because the Lord put up with us for so long that he might save us. As cute as you think you are, Many of us think we're the cutest thing in heaven. Well, God wanted to save me. Of course, I'm a cute person. Well, as cute as you think you are, you and I, we, we irritated him by the things that we did. We provoked him. You know, but he was patient. For me, his patience extended over 20 years and still continues in many ways. How old were you when you got saved? 30, 40 50, all those years he showed this long-suffering for you and for me. So he shows long-suffering. And so if we were to understand that with the Lord, we could extend that to other people. We extend it because it's been given to us. And long-suffering is something the Lord has for us. In, in Psalm 86, verse 15, uh, the psalmist said, You, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Now, long-suffering is an outgrowth of humility and gentleness because the patient person endures negative circumstances and resists giving in to them. In verse 13, he continues and he says, bearing with one another. When it's the word bearing, it means to put up with somebody, to put up with them. Now, bearing with one another is the opposite of quick anger or getting revenge. It's, the re, it's resisting the urge to get even right now. And this kind of love literally throws a blanket over another person's faults. It doesn't ignore, it doesn't justify, but it does resist the temptation of pointing out someone else's faults to others out of spite or out of malice. You're bearing with one another. And bearing reveals a love. In 1 Peter 4 verse 8, uh, Peter said, love covers a multitude of sins. In 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love bears all things. In Proverbs 10, verse 12, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. And so he says, bear with one another. And then he goes on saying, forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. The word forgive speaks of releasing someone from a debt they owe you. They did something, and it's, it's like a debt, and down they owe you. And forgiving is to release them of that debt. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 6, verse 12. He said, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. There are those who are in jail constantly, because emotionally in jail, because they will not release somebody who has done something to them. They remain in emotional jail. If you are unforgiving, you're in prison. You're a prisoner of unforgiveness. And when you finally release it and forgive them of that debt, when you finally release it, two people are set free, that person and yourself. You are also set free. And one of the ways for you to know that you have actually forgiven is if you can honestly pray for them and ask God to please bless their life. 
that's when you begin to know, hey, I have forgiven this person. When you can honestly say, God, be with them. God, help them. God, move in them. You know that you actually have released them of their debt. And that's what we are called to do. We bear with one another. We forgive one another. We release them of their debts. And then he goes on in verse 14, and he says, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Now, this is the source that enables all these other commandments to be kept. In Romans 13, 9 and 10, the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is not an emotion. Love is the decision of the will. And it's much deeper than what we call, what many people call love today, speak of love. I've discovered something over time. I've discovered that love actually has various facets and various, and it's very deep and it, it applies in various ways. But we today, we have this sense that I can only love the lovely people and this and that when in fact we're called to love others. And we've, I think, gotten a mistaken idea that love is really a romantic, romantic notion. It's something that we, that we find ourselves falling into or falling out of. But in reality, love is the decision of the will. It's a choice that I make. So as a young man will say, I, I meet a young girl and, and I kind of like her. She's going to school with me or I, I see her on the job or at a Bible study, whatever. And, and I, I, I sense an attraction, especially when I'm talking to her, I'm introduced to her and, and I start thinking, boy, she's nice, she's funny, she's sweet or whatever. So I kind of like her, and now I look forward to seeing her when I go to work or whatever. And when I see her, I always want to say hi. She seems to be nice, too, because she actually takes a moment to say hi to me to the point where I start thinking, I wonder if I could ask her out. Now, Marie doesn't like it when I do that. No. (laughs) I say to myself, I wonder if she'd go out. So I don't know, I don't know how confident you men are, but I wasn't the most confident, so I'd be real nervous. And so I'm nervous and I'm thinking, well, what's it gonna hurt if she says no, everybody else has, and so I'll ask her out, right? So, hey, are you gonna be busy this weekend? Oh, she says, well, no, not really, I don't have plans. And so you say, well, would you like to go get a cup of coffee or go, whatever. Yeah, I think, that, and, and, and the guy's trying to be all cool and this and that. Like you say, that's cool, you know, I'll need your number and this and that, I'll get in touch with you. And you go, and you're biting your thumb, you're so excited, because you're going out on a date. So you pick her up, and when you pick her up, guess what? She's fun, she's just as fun and even more fun now that you're not in that workplace or whatever, and you start to like her. Now you're liking her deeply. All of these are decisions you're making. You're liking her deeply, now you're starting to really care about her, so you get to the point where you're wondering how she feels about you, but she's starting to show you that she kind of likes you too. And before you know it, you're starting to feel that this like is more than just like and affection. This, this is something that is moving me to thinking I could stay with this person the rest of my life. And then you begin to realize as all decisions that I'm beginning to love this person. I have love for her. I love her. And now guess what? She says to you, she has deeper affection than just like too. She says to you, I love you. And then you say, oh, this is great. And so now you're loving each other. And so now when you're hanging up the phone, if you ever do, you're saying to her, you know, I love you, baby. And she's saying, oh, yeah, you big gorgeous hunk of man and, and all of that. And, and you're feeling quite the man. Then one, day, then one day you go out and buy some Cracker Jacks and you find a, a ring in it. And you take it to her and you ask her, would you make the greatest decision of your life outside of your commitment to Christ and will you marry me? And, and you, kind, you kind of know she will because you've already kind of tested the waters and she's got nobody else that she's seen, at least nobody that you know of. And so, and she says, well, why not? And oh, you're so excited. And then you get married. And then you have that, now you're in love. Now you have that honeymoon love. 
And the honeymoon, oh, you're like, your eyes are, you know, she wakes up, she doesn't have bad breath. I mean, she's just gorgeous all the time, right? And, and so that's, that's part of what happens. And, and yet, now that you're married, you see, you've seen things when you were dating that you thought, well, those things can change. <laughs> they don't. But you think they can. You know, she does this or he does that. You know, those are things that can change with some training and a little pressure. And, and women have a whole list of things they're going to do to make you what you are eventually because that's what God's put them on earth to do. And so they understand that. And so what happens is now you're married. You're going through your honeymoon, whether it's a honeymoon week, a honeymoon month, a hun honeymoon year. It could be long time. It's just everything. She walks on water every time she walks in the door. You know, you hear music playing and flowers and you know, and uh, birds and everything. But then you start discovering some things that, yeah, these are things that are... But you're making decisions. You're saying to yourself, it doesn't matter these things that bother me sometimes. They really don't matter. Because the things that matter, I've decided to concentrate on, and the things that don't matter are the things that she'll either deal with or I have to get used to. That's okay. And after a while, it may be five years, it may be 10 years, it may be 15 years, 20, 30, 40 years or more, you begin to realize something in this relationship that it was all a series of decisions from the first disappointment to where you are now. And you also realize that you've spent a whole bunch of life together a whole lot of life together. You've gone through the joys where you've had your first baby and you've gone through the sorrows when you've lost one. You, 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 you go through the, the moments of happiness and you go through the moments of tears. You go through the seasons of joy and you go through, sometimes it seems like a prolonged season of pain. And, and at the end of it all, and you're looking at each other, and you're no longer that 20, 25-year-old person, 30-year-old person anymore. You know, you, you, you're getting up in the morning, and your back hurts, and your feet are swollen, you know, and you're thinking, oh, I, uh, what, what's going on with me? And, and you, you turn to your wife, and you say to your wife, honey, will you love me when I'm old and weak? She says, yeah, I do. I meant five years from now, ten years from now. No, 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 you've been that for a long time. I made that decision a long time ago. Love. Listen, we have to be aware of the fact, and, and this is a, just a silly little attempted illustration to say one thing. Love is a decision. It's not your feelings. It's not how they make you feel all the time. It's who they are. And in your life, there are people that will come in and out of it in a church. And let's face it, are very difficult. Some of the most difficult people I've ever met have been Christians. I I'm ready and prepared to handle the world because I know the world and what it does. It's hard to put up with rude Christians. It's hard to put up with self-seeking pseudo-believers. It's hard to put up with judgmental people who are always finding something wrong in you. What you said, what you didn't do, what you should have done, isn't it? It can be hard. To find a moment when your heart has been broken, you need to find a brother or a sister to share with, and you do. And before you know it, it's on the prayer chain. Everybody knows your personal business. It breaks your heart, and you get hurt over it. And that's where forgiveness and that's where love comes in. That's where the compassion, that's where the loving kindness, that's where all of that starts working in you. Because listen, Christianity doesn't work just when it's, when it's sunny outside. It works in the middle of storms too. As a matter of fact, that's when your, your faith really very often is exposed as what it really is and the deepness that it really has is when you're going through these valleys and going through these tough times and going through the hardships and going through that pain. And, and he had said a, a moment before, he says, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do, but put on love. Because if Christ forgave me, who am I that I can't forgive you? Who am I that I can't forgive you? I sinned against God. You sinned against me. My sin against God is greater than what you did to me. 
And if, if, if God forgave me, who am I to not forgive you, to release you of that debt? And what is it that provokes me? Not, a, not an emotion. I have to be honest with you. There have been times when people have hurt me, seriously hurt. Yeah, I get hurt. People do. I do too. But I could go to bed at night, put my head on a pillow, and I could say, oh, Lord, I want to pray. Break his teeth, oh, Lord. Break his legs. And Jesus, David prayed that way. My name's David. Must be my prayer. <laughs> it's a lot easier to wish ill on somebody than to pray God's mercy on somebody. And in churches, churches are filled with people who climb in cars and drive to other places because someone didn't look at them right. Because somebody didn't move over quickly enough when they wanted to sit down. The pettiness of the body of Christ is sinful in so many ways. In so many ways. If you don't look like me, if you're not from my race, my culture, my language, whatever, you really aren't one of us. There's so much like that that go on. We deal with it. We deal with it. That's true. It's all true. We deal with it. How? We put on love, which is the bond of peace. Because it doesn't matter. We have to get to this point. It doesn't matter if you're brown, if you're white, if you're red, if you're yellow, if you're black. It doesn't matter. You're my brother or you're my sister. You are saved. I am saved. We need to get along together. We're going to heaven. Let's love one another. That's how it works. It's the decision of the will. That's what we do. That's what we do. That's how it works. And so that's something I had to learn. That's something we have to learn to do. It's not an emotion. It's an attitude, a decision of the heart. I decided to do these things. Yeah, I, I still remember. I'll say one last thing. I, I, yeah, I still remember. You know, yeah, I play with the guys and tease like it's only women. No, my children got, got sick. There was more than one time when I would carry a vomiting baby to a, to a bathroom. There were, there have been, you know, to wash them up and to clean them, to save mama from having to do that. You know, to change those dirty diapers and to give them those baths and things like that. I came from a culture that said women do that. I'm a Mexican, man. <laughs> women do that. And man, we look at them. I do diapers. I say, honey, do that diaper. But I learned to do that. And by the way, you know, I'm an old man now. I haven't always been an old man. I, I, I was a young man. I had babies, you know, and I'm carrying babies. In my culture, you don't carry babies. The woman carries the babies. The Mexicans hang around with their friends. And the women, that, you know I'm telling you the truth. That's the truth. <laughs> women in the kitchen with the kids and guys in the front room drinking coffee or whatever. Am I wrong? I don't think so. That's what we do. And if a woman wanders into the, hey guys, if a woman wanders into the front room while the guys are talking, what do you do? I'll tell you what you do. You get quiet. And you look at them. And they'll smile at you. What are you guys talking about? And we say, nothing. And they say, oh. And then one of the older women will come take her by the arm and bring her back into the kitchen. <laughs> And then we go on talking the way we do. See, so I, that's a fact. And so I am a young man carrying babies. And don't think that I didn't get guys looking at me wondering. What kind of man is that? And me, I cry. Carry babies cry? <laughs> one and one is two. And I made a decision a long time ago. I'm going to love. And if I, and if I cry, I cry. If I, if I love my baby, you'll know about it. Because I'm going to be a man, not what the world told me to be, but what Jesus made me to be. And that's what God calls us to do. And it's hard. It's not easy. But that's what you do. You die to these things. It's a decision of the will. To love those who don't love you. To pray for those who have despitefully used you and to bless them it's not easy to do but in the power of Christ you can and that's what keeps churches together because the church on wheels if somebody hurts my feelings I'll just go to another church and I'll take my bitterness with me and I'll tell other people you never need to go over there because that place over there is mean they don't love people like me that's not true that's not what the church is supposed to be and so what do we do we put on 
love, which is the bond of perfection. And he says in verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let God's peace rule in your midst, in the church, in you, and be thankful. Again, that's a decision. We can quench the peace of God through division and dissension. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The doctrine or the teachings of Jesus should be our constant study. Not just me on an individual basis, but me individually, but the church together. And so he's saying, let God's word be rooted in you, making your heart its dwelling place. May it be engrafted in you. May it enter you deeply. You see, when God's word is present and the people are well taught, the church becomes healthy. It's going to be centered on the things that matter. It's going to be strong when the latest movement or latest fear or latest doctrine encroaches on their lives. And because of their love for God and one another, the people will encourage one another. They're going to be capable of teaching, of warning, and keeping each other in line. They're going to be able to do that because they know the Word of God. The Word of Christ in verse 16 will dwell in them with wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another. There'll be a, a, a place of worship, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and you sing with grace in your heart to the Lord. That's one of the reasons why we as a church need to remember and realize that coming in during the worship time and singing with the Lord is actually an offering you're giving to God. You're giving of yourself to Him and you're vocalizing your faith to Him. And then when you empty yourself of yourself by giving to Him, then the Word of God is presented and you can receive those things that help you to live a life that pleases Him. And it works that way because worship as we sing is not just songs. What it is, it's encouragement to others around us. It's a, it's a community of faith-filled believers sharing the same faith in Christ. And it's an emptying of myself, of myself, because I'm centering my attention on Him. And as I have given to Him an offering of my praise, then He through His Word teaches me how to live for Him. And then finally, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Amen, yeah. Your life becomes centered on Christ and you become thankful. Remember that the main purpose of life is not your own happiness, but God's glory. If you have one thing that you walk out today remembering, remember that. Jesus did not die on the cross to make me happy. Jesus died on the cross that I might be holy so that my life might, might be a living testimony of the reality of a God who loves, who transforms sinners, makes them into saints, fills them with his presence and his power, and uses him to reach a world that is lost, hurting, empty, and supplying the answer that gives him purpose. This all comes through the faith of Christ. May the word of God dwell in us richly, richly.